Dear friends, we have this morning the familiar story of Doubting Thomas. Thomas is the disciple who wasn't with the group when Jesus appears to them on Easter Sunday. We don't know why. Then, when he hears what the other disciples tell him, he expresses incredulity. He doubts. He is too frightened to give in to his hopes, and he says, unless he puts his hands in his wounds, he won't believe. And then he meets Jesus for himself, and he puts his hands in the wounds, and he exclaims, my Lord and my God. It's a familiar story, perhaps too familiar. It fits into a pattern of debate between science and Christian faith that is itself a problem. So I'd like to explore with you this morning what's actually going on in this story. Thomas has become notorious for doubting, but that's not actually the key role that he plays in this story, or indeed in the Gospel of John as a whole, for his role is actually to be the one who gives voice to the message of the Gospel itself, to be the one who invites the listener to affirm the same thing, my Lord and my God. Keep in mind that John's Gospel is written a generation later than the others, towards the end of the first century. Indeed, John assumes that his listeners were familiar with at least Mark's Gospel amongst the others. So these are disciples, church members, who have never known Jesus personally. All they know are the people who know Jesus. So there are bound to be questions and concerns, and here is Thomas expressing those doubts, giving validity to those doubts, and then triumphantly overcoming them. Now that Thomas has seen, he believes. But Jesus says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Which describes all Christians after that first generation, including you and me. But what is it that Thomas is doubting? It seems so obvious. He's doubting the resurrection, surely. Well, not quite. Not in the way we often think. We live in a society that, for very clear historical reasons, going back a few centuries, doesn't believe in miracles. But then, it doesn't understand miracles in the first place, because it thinks that miracles are violations of the laws of physics. So it's impossible for there to be a miracle. And if it's impossible for there to be a miracle, then obviously there was no resurrection, and Thomas is the only rational disciple out of the whole bunch of them. Our society is deeply deluded about miracles. No, the issue here is not whether there can be a miracle like the resurrection. The worldview accepted by everyone in Jesus' time allowed for miracles. They were understood as signs, gestures of God's power, and resurrection as such was accepted as a possibility. It was argued about, it was rejected by some, affirmed by others, but the key thing for the Thomas story is that it emphasises the bodiliness of the resurrection. In other words, it's all about the wounds. Consider that Jesus was executed, and according to the law of Moses in Deuteronomy, one who is hung to death on a tree is considered cursed by God. What we have in this story is the restoration of the crucified one as vindicated by God. This turns everything upside down. The issue is not that someone's returned from the dead, in the way that, say, Lazarus did. There are lots of stories of such things happening. That would have been a marvellous thing, but it wouldn't be something that turns the world upside down. No, the important thing to understand about the resurrection is that Jesus actually died. He actually died. Resurrection is not resuscitation. The resurrected life of Jesus is not a continuation of his earthly life. Well, his earthly life ends with the crucifixion. He actually died. Rather, the resurrection is the eternal life of Jesus breaking through in bodily form, a form that Thomas can touch. The resurrection is the vindication of Jesus against the ways of death. The one who has died can die no more. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Jesus is alive and can never die again and he has opened up the path for us to follow. And what is that path? Three times in our Gospel reading this morning, Jesus says to his disciples, Peace be with you. Why does he repeat that? Remember the context. The disciples had abandoned Jesus, they'd run away in fear. Were they expecting anger from the one they'd left to be slaughtered? Instead, they receive forgiveness. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto them, into them, and it enables them to pass it on. 
Forgiveness is the way of living in the resurrection. The previous forms of legitimacy have been overthrown. The one who is executed and cursed under the law is now raised up above the law. To believe in Christ is to have life in his name. And this is the experience of divine forgiveness. This is the experience of grace. This is the hallmark of the resurrection. And to me, it's the best evidence for the resurrection that forgiveness is possible, that grace is amazing. Rome Williams once wrote this. There is no hope of understanding the resurrection outside the process of renewing humanity and forgiveness. We're all agreed that the empty tomb proves nothing. We need to add that no amount of apparitions, however well authenticated, would mean anything either, apart from the testimony of forgiven lives communicating forgiveness. The empty tomb proves nothing because by itself it's just odd. The true witness to the resurrection is the transformation of lives through the Holy Spirit, and that is, the force which enables us to set an accounting of sin to one side and to live with each other with forgiveness. The risen Christ came and stood amongst his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. May his risen life be in all of us, today and always. Amen.